Hey everybody, it's Jackie. Uh, and in today's lecture, we are continuing chapter 22, focusing on body art and feminist art practices. To summarize the last lecture, we were looking at conceptual art during the 1960s, which I have broken into different categories here, ranging from artists interested in language, such as Joseph Kosuth, to early video artists like Name June Pike and Bruce Nauman. Now, these categorizations may help you keep track of the varying themes among the conceptual artists, but please note that there were overlaps in many cases. As we discussed in the previous lecture, the conceptual artists had a natural affinity towards performance because these art events often freed artists from producing a physical output. One form of performance body art used the physical body of the artist themselves as its site. As we will see today, these works often included a strong sense of intimacy between the viewer and the performer. Remember that the late 1960s saw the beginning of the women's movement, which exposed the cultural, political, and economic consequences of biology. Women started to use their own bodies to explore and confront these ideas within the culture at large, and Marina Abramovich, Carolee Schneeman, Hannah Wilka, among others, are a few examples of artists using their bodies as their medium to grapple with the changing societal norms. To begin our analysis of body art, we will first look at the work of a collaborative pair. Marina Abramovich and Ule were romantic partners and artistic collaborators for 12 years. This couple was among the first to use their bodies as a means for artistic exploration. In their work about similarity, shown here, both were present on stage as Ule sewed his mouth shut with a single piece of string. Then Abramovich took questions from the audience and answered on his behalf since he was unable to do so himself. In this work titled Rest Energy from 1980, the couple stand facing each other dressed almost identically. Abramovich pulls the handle of an archery bow. Both wore microphones to magnify the sound of their beating hearts. From these performances, you can see that the way they use their bodies varied, as did the level of viewer participation, though often there was some level of discomfort involved from the audience. Let's take a look at a 2010 performance by Abramovich, who continued to be very active after her partnership with Ule had dissolved.
So as you saw in this work, Abramovich was seated inside the main lobby of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City all day, every day, for several months as viewers waited in line to sit across from her. Now this performance took great endurance and physical strength from Abramovich who took no breaks for sometimes eight or ten hours at a time. Perhaps equally provocative are the works of body, arts, body artist Carolee Schneeman. Here we are looking at a photograph documenting one of her renditions of Meat Joy, a piece that offers viewers a hedonistic snapshot of the liberatory spirit of the 1960s. Yet her most famous work is Interior Scroll, shown here. By the 1970s, Schneeman's performance works were at the intersection of culture, the female body, and the combined meaning of both. Interior Scroll was an exceptionally haunting performance that involved Schneeman slowly removing a scroll from her vagina, which she read as the text became available. The text itself was about a confrontation with a male filmmaker. Describing this work, Schneeman stated, I thought of a vagina in many ways, physically, conceptually, as a sculptural form, an architectural referent, the source of sacred knowledge, ecstasy, birth, passage, transformation. Here is the full text from the scroll. I met a happy man, a structuralist filmmaker, but don't call me that. It's something else I do, he said. We are fond of you. You are charming, but don't ask us. To look at your films, we cannot. There are certain films we cannot look at. The personal clutter, the persistence of feelings, the hand touch sensibility, the diaristic indulgence, the painterly mess, the dense gestalt. He said, you can do as I do, take one clear process, follow its strictest implications intellectually, establish a system of permutations, establish their visual set. My work has no meaning beyond the logic of its systems. I have done away with emotion, intuition, inspiration, those aggrandized habits which set artists apart from ordinary people, those unclear tendencies which are inflicted upon viewers. He said we can be friends equally, though we are not artists equally. I said we cannot be friends equally, and we cannot be artists equally. And here is another closer look of Schneeman during the performance of this piece. Let's pause for a moment to appreciate the physicality and intimacy involved in this particular work. Similar to Schneeman, Hannah Wilke also focused on the strengths and challenges of being a female artist. SOS Starification Object Series was a work in which she marked her body with signs of distress. The artist was photographed topless, but there were pieces of chewing gum attached to her body that were meant to disrupt the sensuality of the imagery. Cuban-born artist Ana Mendieta used her body often in her work as well. For the artist's fetish series, she created a mummy-shaped mound surrounded by a shallow ditch as if recreating an ancient burial ritual. As an aside, Mendieta was married to the minimalist sculptor Carl Andre, but she died tragically at the age of 36 after she fell, jumped, or was pushed out the window of the couple's 34th floor apartment. The details of the incident are not known, but the couple was arguing and drunk at the time of Mendieta's death, according to some sources. This image may seem rather dull at first pass, but artist Vito Acanche was crouching under the raised floor at the end of this room. In his infamous work titled Seedbed from 1972, Akanshi spent hours masturbating beneath a gallery-wide ramp with a loudspeaker playing the sounds as he did so. Here is a more graphic image as proof of this perverse performance piece. Needless to say, Akanshi made himself vulnerable to audiences during this performance 
and he also ran the risk of alienating viewers. This work combines the element of risk in the artwork in a very real way. On the other hand, his work Instant House from 1980 is far more political in nature. The pieces of the house are flat on the ground, but when a viewer steps inside the house and sits on the swing, the whole structure comes to life. Inside the house, the viewer is surrounded by American flags, while on the outside, viewers see Soviet flags with the iconic hammer and sickle. The juxtaposition of this imagery was intended as a commentary about the United States' involvement in the Cold War. If you felt shocked or disgusted about any of the works we have viewed already today, you may also feel strongly about Chris Burden's piece, Shoot. In 1971, Burden became very well known when he asked for a friend to shoot him in the arm during a performance, stating, in this instant, I was a sculpture. In this still, we see the aftermath of the performance. Whereas in this image, we can see more clearly how this work was executed. Had his friend missed his arm, there could have been a much different outcome for Burden. Later, he stopped making these sorts of violent performances and instead made installations such as All the Submarines of the United States of America from 1987. This work contains 625 miniature models which represent the actual submarines that were used by the United States. The tiny cardboard ships are harmless, but at the same time, they help illustrate the prevalence of these ships. London-based artists Gilbert and George were far less violent, though still provocative. This collaborative pair would transform themselves into living sculpture. Many of their works were humorous, such as the singing sculpture from 1971, in which their faces and hands were covered with metallic paint. The two men wore proper English clothing, moving their mouths as though they were wind-up dolls. Second generation conceptual artist Lori Anderson was known for her talking songs. She was also married to the late singer Lou Reed. United States Part Two from 1980 was a four part epic that covered big themes such as transportation, politics, sociopsychology, and money. Okay. Returning to today's lecture, we're going to look at Rebecca Horn, uh, a German performance artist who explored the limits of the human body with props like large feather costumes or gloves with extremely elongated fingers. The feathered prison fan from 1978 here um, appeared in the artist's first feature length film, which translates to The Gigolo. It was set in a ballet studio, and the film was both sensuous and erotic, with influences ranging from the surrealist Max Ernst, as well as the sculptor Constantine Brancusi. Now that we have discussed body art, let's turn our attention to feminist art. And we will start by looking at the Feminist Art Program. FAP was founded by artists Miriam Shapiro and Judy Chicago at California State University in 1971. FAP wanted to create a space for female artists through their different projects, the most notable of which was Woman House from 1971. FAP moved to the California Institute of Art in 1972, where students began working on Woman House. It was one of the largest installations of the 1970s. Each room of the house was remade as a feminist critique. For example, a linen closet trapped a woman inside as a metaphor for a domestic cage. The menstruation bathroom was easily the most disturbing room in the house with its wastebasket overflowing with evidence of a, women's, of a woman's period. Here are two more rooms inside the house. The kitchen, which has boobs pasted to the walls like decals, and the nursery with its oversized hobby horse that takes on an ominous character because of its foreboding size. 
Reflecting on the meaning of the kitchen in particular, Shapiro said, It became obvious that the kitchen was a battleground where women fought with their mothers for the appropriate share of comfort and love. It was an arena where ostensibly the horn of plenty overflowed, but where in actuality the mother was acting out her bitterness over being imprisoned in a situation from which she could not bring herself to escape, and from which society would not encourage such an escape. Both Shapiro and Chicago had lengthy careers after their work together on the feminist art program, and next we are going to look at another major installation by Chicago, photographed in her studio here in 1975. Judy Chicago's Dinner Party from 1979 is a massive and ambitious work that required many years and numerous volunteers in order to be completed. There are 39 place settings at the table, each one for an important historical or, for tic or fictitious female character. The table is arranged in the shape of a pyramid, an ancient symbol for womanhood, and within the enclosed floor area are the names of 999 women in history and from legend, such as Georgia O'Keeffe and Frida Kahlo, for example. References to the Last Supper, an exclusively male dinner party, are also brought to mind with the number of witches, um, as are the number of witches present in a coven, 13. In 2006, the piece was permanently installed in the Brooklyn Museum's Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. Here is a reproduction of Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper for reference. And here are two detail shots of the place settings at the dinner party. Returning to the world of painting, British realist painter Sylvia Slay made her own eroticized paintings of the female nude from the feminist perspective. The female nude is so ubiquitous throughout Western art history that sometimes viewers are blind to the manipulations, violence, aggression, and distortions that it entails. Slay remade compositions of female bodies, supplanting a male nude form as in Imperial Nude, Paul Rosano from 1977. Born in America, Mary Kelly worked in London for a period of time, and this work, Postpartum Document from 1974, is a log of the early childhood development of her son in comparison with the psychological changes of herself as a new mother. The work includes imprints of diaper stains, handprints, artwork, lists, medical and educational records, diagrams, and confessional notes. Like other feminist artists, Kelly is concerned with the unique challenges of being an artist and a woman, especially as it pertains to motherhood, a topic that is not often addressed with this level of scrutiny. In 1985, a group of anonymous feminist activists made a series of public appearances in gorilla masks and posted advertisements like the one we are looking at. They resembled public service announcements and they were pasted around New York City. They called themselves the Gorilla Girls with their identities shielded by their masks and costumes. And they have remained anonymous even today, explaining, quote, mainly we wanted the focus to be on the issues, not on our personalities or our own work, end quote. Among the so-called advantages of being a female artist listed on this poster is, quote, working without the pressure of success, end quote. This ironic poster by the Gorilla Girls exposed iniquities within the art world, many of which linger today. Gnaw appears to be two large cube sculptures that could be associated with minimalism, but a deeper look reveals that these works are made of fat and chocolate. Artist Janine and Tony has in fact gnawed them, chewing off mouthfuls of each material. She's eaten materials like these to the point of near illness or vomiting. In her lipstick display, Antoni used the material she had chewed to create a case that resembles a chocolate box and lipstick tubes, preferring a feminist critique of materialism and consumption to viewers. 
Here we see Antoni mopping the floor with her hair. She said, I mopped the floor with my hair. The reason I'm so interested in taking my body to those extreme places is that that's a place where I learn, where I feel most in my body. I'm really interested in the repetition, the discipline, and what happens to me psychologically when I put my body to that extreme place. As with the body artists, many of the feminist artists were interested in creating work that pushed boundaries, physically and culturally speaking. French artist Sylvie Fleury also took aim at consumerism by confronting the idea that a buyer is shaped by the products one consumes. In her Formula One dresses, Fleury created a fashion series in which the women who wear these dresses are the equivalent of a corporate-sponsored racing team, thus conflating the women with sports cars. While the works of these feminist artists were cutting edge during the 1970s, few artists today can ignore the effects of gender within their practices. And with that, we will now highlight several artists addressing another important cultural issue that was shifting during the 1960s. Against the backdrop of the civil rights movement, some artists began to explore the relationship of racial politics within the arts. Created in Chicago in 1967 by the Visual Arts Workshop of the Organization of Black American Cultures, The Wall of Respect was one of the first works to address the experiences of African Americans. The Wall was a collaborative mural created by artists and residents of the Southside neighborhood, and it contained a collection of portraits of important Black figures such as Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Charlie Parker, Aretha Franklin, and Muhammad Ali. The site slowly became a source of power. Gangs competed for access to the mural, and there was violence, even a murder at one point. Nonetheless, the group stuck together and tried to use art as a means of uniting disparate communities. Wadsworth Jurel's Revolutionary is a portrait of the Black Panther Party leader Angela Davis. Behind her head, the words resist, revolution, black nation time are visible. The bright, saturated colors of this painting were intentional as they aided in the work's ability to be reproduced and spread. During the mid-1970s, the artist and activist Judy Baca worked on a half-mile-long mural of the Tujinga Wash Drainage Canal in the San, Fran San Fernando Valley. Baca founded SPARC, the Social and Public Art Resource Center, a nonprofit organization that, quote, produces, distributes, preserves, and documents community-based public artworks that reflect the lives and concerns of America's diverse ethnic populations, women, working people, youth, and the elderly, end quote. Spark has sponsored numerous public murals throughout LA, which can be viewed on their website, sparkmurals.org. Blending folk art with high art, New York-based artist Faith Ringgold was likewise stepfast in her devotion of exposing the experiences of Black Americans. This story quilt was created in 1982, and it recalls the story of Aunt Jemima, a restaurateur and matriarch. In a similar vein, David Hammonds used his art as a form of protest. Here in Justice Case from 1970 shows a bound and gagged captive, possibly a prisoner of war. The border is created by an American flag, emphasizing the sense of conceptual contrast between the negative of the figure and the associations of the flag. In higher goals, Hammonds applied bottle caps to hundreds of telephone poles with basketball hoops placed at the very top, far beyond what any person could hope to reach. Hammonds explained, quote, it's an anti-basketball sculpture. Basketball has become a problem in the black community because the kids are getting an education. That's why it's called higher goals. It means you should have higher goals in life than basketball, end quote. Robert Colescott was the first African-American artist to represent the United States of America at the Venice Biennale in 1997. Colescott trained at Berkeley and then in Paris with the artist Ferdinand Leger from 1949 to 1950. His painting seen here, George Washington Carver, crossing the Delaware, page from an American textbook from 1975, 
takes an ironic twist by reversing the roles of race that calls from American history painting traditions. Cole Scott explained, quote, unfortunately, stereotypical images are part of American heritage. I had to come to terms with it for myself, ultimately controlling the images by making them say some things for me, end quote. Adrienne Piper holds a PhD in philosophy, and she uses her educational background to shine a light on racial injustices. In her work, Political Self-Portrait No. 2 from 1978, Piper provides a detailed account of the prejudices she encountered while growing up. For Piper, she felt a, quote, compulsion to embody, transform, and use experiences as a woman of color in constructive ways in order not to feel powerless, end quote. Piper also created Calling Cards, a series of notes that read things like this. Dear friend, I am black. I'm sure you did not realize this when you made, laughed at, agreed with that racist remark. I regret any discomfort my presence is causing you, just as I am sure you regret the discomfort your racism is causing me. Remember, if there's one thing to take away from today's lecture, in conceptual art, the idea is the art. Here again, I have broken out today's artists into various categories to help you. And as you reflect on this lecture, keep in mind some of these questions. What are some of the different ways that the conceptual artists reacted to the political uproar of the 1960s? Describe specific areas of conflict within culture at this time. How were the conceptual artists different from the minimalists? Who were some of the key artists of early video art? Who were some of the important figures within early feminist art? And finally, which artists grappled with the idea of race in their works? And don't forget the vocabulary terms. That's it for this lecture. Thanks for tuning in, everybody.